Hello, everyone. Welcome to Yao. Um, I'm not sure if it's a good thing if I, uh, that I get to speak first, and it looks like I've got a full house here, so I think the pressure's on. Um, welcome to my talk. It's just-in-time architecture. Uh, I work with a company called VGW, that's Virtual Gaming Worlds, and we're a Perth startup turned not quite startup anymore, uh, and we're also platinum sponsors of the Yao conference this year in Sydney. Here's the crew. This is most of them, almost all of them. Some of you might recognize the seasoned Yao speaker at the front there. And this talk was originally put together for and presented for these people at our internal tech conference called Tectonic. The reason I point this out is the target audience for Tectonic was the, the many new team members that we hired over the year prior um, that we wanted to level up. Um, and a lot of them had sort of come from uh, unconventional backgrounds. We made a, a conscious effort to, to bring people in from not just university, but from all, all over um, and, and learn and develop them, uh, teach and develop them and bring them up. So a lot of them have unconventional pathways into the tech industry. This means you might hear about some topics that you already know about. Uh, this talk covers some of the basics, but uh, Yao is, from my perspective, usually a more experienced audience. But we try to make this talk so that people at any level can get something from it. And hopefully you do. So I'm going to be talking about three main topics. We'll start with the uh, story and the journey of a growing games company. Uh, and then we'll take a detour and talk a little bit about event-driven architectures, and then we'll bring it home with communication patterns. So let's imagine we all work for a growing games company. Does anyone work in games? Does anyone make games? Literally no one, great, okay. <laughs> um, if someone had put their hand up, I would say that this meeting that I'm gonna talk about might sound a bit familiar, but maybe it'll sound familiar to you anyway. So the product managers and stakeholders of our company believe that we can make more revenue by allowing customers to personalize their experience in game. That's a pretty, pretty standard thing. So all of our stakeholders call a meeting with the team, all of the engineers and the testers and the designers, and there's lots of debate about how best to approach this. After the dust settles, our product manager grabs a marker, walks up to the board, and scribbles out some squares and some boxes that look a little bit like this. What we've got here is an avatar store where players can purchase, uh, choose which avatar they want to buy. Uh, we can see we've got a balance up the top. That's what we use to buy them with. And then a preview of each avatar is shown with the name and the cost and a buy button, so you can click that and purchase it if you want. And the avatars, importantly, have artificial scarcity, a bit like an NFT, maybe. Well, I don't think we talk about NFTs anymore. Um, so once they run out, they're gone. Over in the corner, you can see the front engineer, front end engineers. They've both lit up immediately. Uh, they, they've both come up with the front, uh, ideal front end architecture, and they're ready to go, so they just leave the room. Now we just have to decide what the server-side application architecture is going to look like. So the server-side engineers get to work, and we start to think a little bit about all the steps that might be involved in this workflow. Firstly, we have to figure out, uh, we'll have to have a step to validate the request. Um, we don't want anyone cheating this system and buying up all the avatars. Uh, then what will happen is the server will need to deduct that cost from the customer's balance, and then once that uh, cost is deducted from the balance, the avatar can be assigned to that player. You're going to start noticing some reoccurring language, so I've underlined that here. We have checkout, deduct, balance, assign, and inventory. The team decides that the easiest way to approach this is to integrating, uh, integrate into the existing monolithic architecture. So what we can see here is we're handling multiple operations within a single request lifecycle and there's no need to communicate with any other systems. It's just one server talking to its database. And we can leverage this really powerful thing here called atomic database transactions. So I've circled that there. But let's talk a little bit about that. So they allow us to perform a series of operations on the database such that either all of those operations succeed or all of those operations fail. And this prevents us from entering any weird states where, for example, we take the customer's balance, we take the, the cost of the avatar, but then we don't give them the avatar because we don't complete that second step. Hands up, who bought a coffee here this morning? Cool, someone actually put their hand up this time, great. Um, the flow I've just described is a bit like going to the cafe to order a coffee. 
Um, so from the customer's perspective, I'll give the cashier the money. Uh, the cashier will check that it's enough to buy the coffee, put it in the till, uh, and then they'll make your coffee and give it to you. It's fairly straightforward. But then fast forward a year, the product is successful and the team has grown in size. We've got more engineers on the team now and some problems are starting to show up here. The engineers are complaining that the IDE is taking a long time to load. The build time is increasing. It takes a long time to run all the tests. There are regular merge conflicts because everyone's working on top of each other. There's no boundaries uh, and no separation of concerns. And we've got a high batch size for small changes. The changes themselves are not individually deployable. So this isn't necessarily a problem from a downtime perspective. The team uh, correctly set up zero downtime deployments from, from day one. But because it's so large, they take 10 minutes. So if we want to be doing 50 of those a day, then we've got back-to-back -back deployments all day. We just take up that queue entirely. Productivity and morale is starting to take a dive. So why did this happen? Well, if we remember, the team is working on a monolithic architecture. How do I know it's a monolith? How do I know one when I see it? We all, we all might have some idea, but let's define it. For me, it's associated with old software. So software packages like Microsoft Word or Adobe Photoshop, or maybe your favorite video game. Anything that used to come on a CD or DVD in a box. But just because we built an application recently using the latest modern framework React, Vue, JS, something, doesn't mean it's not a monolith. A monolithic architecture is usually hosted within one code base and it couples all of the business concerns together. To make a change to this sort of application requires updating the entire stack. This can make updating the stack quite restrictive and potentially time consuming, leading to infrequent updates that are costly relative to the package size. So to summarize, this solution I think did what it needed to do at the time. We validated the hypothesis about personalized avatars. We got to market quickly. And the chosen architecture actually has some unique and powerful characteristics. We can do this really cool thing called atomic transactions, for example. But over time, the developer experience has started to suck, especially as the team grew. The boundaries of our monolithic architecture became unclear. And we had a lot of people working over the top of each other. And the other part was that this workflow couldn't be deployed without deploying everything else at the same time. And there are a number of downsides there too. So how could we fix this? Let's go back to our cafe for a minute. Um, a monolithic architecture might be a little bit like a cafe operated by a single person. So this is Adam, he owns this cafe. And he currently has three responsibilities. He has to take orders, and then he pulls the coffee, and then he pours the milk. He works quickly, so he's never had any issues keeping up with demand. But Adam feels he's better at talking to customers than he ever was at making coffee. So what does he do? Adam hires two new employees, of course. So now we've got Sarah and James. Sarah is an expert in pulling coffee, so she's responsible for operating the coffee machine. And James has a master's degree in latte art, so he's responsible for pouring the milk. This is now two less things that Adam has to worry about, and he can focus on providing really good customer service. Importantly, everyone here can work independently of each other. I think this makes sense in a cafe. This is probably what you usually see. So can we do something in software? Hands up if you can see where this is going. Yeah, everyone's got their hand up now, great. Microservices. So the team has heard a lot about this new architecture called microservices, so they decide to do a little bit of research. A microservices architecture is a way that we can help enforce boundaries, and it's also, uh, it also allows parts of the system to be deployed independently of each other. So it sounds like it could probably solve some of our problems, right? The team has agreed to split up the monolith and create boundaries between each domain concept. So we have, and you'll recognize this language from before, the store, that tells me what things are for sale. The balance, that tells me how many coins I have. And the inventory, which tells me what things I've purchased and what things I own. And this is what the workflow looks like now. So we can see here that the client sends a checkout request to the store. The store sends a request to the balance service and deducts the balance. And then once it gets a response, 
it sends a request to the inventory to assign the avatar to the customer. Once it gets a response from the inventory, it returns a response to the client to say that the checkout is completed. We have our entire workflow in a single request lifecycle. And the team's pretty happy with themselves. We did it, team. We did microservices. But hold on a minute. Something isn't quite right. Our customers are unhappy. So after doing some digging, we find that a lot of the customers are reporting that their balance gets deducted, but they don't receive the avatar. Customer support is receiving thousands of complaints from customers every single day, and engineers are wasting a lot of time helping customer support manually compensate those customers that didn't get their, their avatar. And then perhaps worst of all, fed up customers are just leaving uh, and revenue is dropping. The team decided to look at the architecture and investigate possible failure scenarios. The team notices that occasionally the balance services crash after deducting the balance. The store receives no response from the balance service. Uh, and then that means it times out. It doesn't know whether the balance was deducted or not. We cannot proceed to the next step to send a request to the inventory and assign the avatar because we don't know what happened. In this scenario, the workflow timed out and was left in an incomplete state. The customer's balance was debited, but the item was not assigned to the customer's inventory. So with that in mind, couldn't we just retry? Let's just try it again. Uh, maybe it'll work this time. If the balance service goes down, how long is it before it comes back up? It could be down for a little while. With that in mind, this could cause more and more requests to keep piling up while they're retrying over and over. Question is, how many times do we keep retrying? When the balance service comes back online, what's going to happen? We might get a flood of these retrying requests all at the same time, and then it just crashes again. So that's not ideal. Retrying doesn't really seem to be the solution here. On top of that, what if our store crashed halfway through workflow? Again, it appears that the balance might be deducted and an avatar not assigned to the customer, although it's difficult to know for sure. I think generally, this type of workflow is unreliable. There are many examples where the failure of one service in this workflow leads to the failure of the entire workflow. And this means we have what is called an availability coupling. This workflow needs all three services to be available at the same time. If each service has a 99.9% .9 availability, or a 99% in this case, the availability of the workflow as a whole is a multiplication of all three of those availabilities which turns out to be 97%. So 97% might be very good if you're in university. That's a high distinction. You've done really well. But in our case, that means this system as a whole can be down for as many as 11 whole days per year. Imagine if Netflix is down for 11 whole days per year. I don't think that's really acceptable. And it actually gets worse the more services we add into this workflow. If you recall, there are now three employees in our cafe. Adam, who works, uh, works the customers and takes payments. You've got Sarah, who pulls the coffee shots, and James, who handles the milk. Let's say Adam takes the payment from a customer. Adam then uh, orders Sarah to pull the coffee shot, but at this time, Sarah's just received an emergency call, and she's had to leave her station. Because Sarah's not there, Adam drops the order and just moves on to the next customer. This results in the payment being taken, but the coffee not made for the customer. Here, again, there is an availability coupling. And although Adam and Sarah are working on different things and can work independently of each other, Adam needs Sarah to be there when an order comes through. Otherwise, the order is lost. I don't think cafes usually work like this. So what can we do? Uh, we'll get that to that in a minute. I forgot this slide was here. Uh, by splitting up into multiple services, we were able to enforce boundaries that allow each team to independently deploy each service. Other different problems arose, though, uh, in terms of reliability when the team uh, moved to multiple services. The availability of the system as a whole decreased due to an availability coupling, requiring all three services to be available at the same time. This leads to workflows becoming unreliable, Balances would be deducted, but the avatars were not being assigned to the customers. What we'd actually implemented here was a distributed monolith, not microservices. 
So I think we need to go back to the drawing board. I think we can solve some of the issues that this team has with an event-driven architecture. So let's talk a little bit about that. Firstly, let's cover exactly what an event is. So an event represents a change in state. So it's a representation of a thing that happened. It's an immutable fact. So ideally, it shouldn't change. We can't rewrite history. Uh, and generally, it's also something that happened in the past. So if we're looking at an event, uh, we should assume it could be something that happened very recently or a long time ago. AWS defines event-driven architectures as an architecture that uses events to trigger and communicate between decoupled services. So it's a really common architecture pattern applied to microservices. And I think it could be a way to solve some of our microservices issues. The team starts doing some research about event-driven architectures. When they start digging into it, a few uh, patterns and, and, I guess, terms keep coming up. You have event notification and event carried state transfer. So let's see what these two mean. This is what event notification looks like. So what happens is we send an event of something that happened. All it gives us is the identifier of the thing that changed. And then it's up to the consumer to decide whether it needs to do anything about that. If the balance service gets this event to deduct the customer's balance, that there is the ID of the, the checkout that got created. So what we'll probably need to do is go back to the store and ask which customer and how much and which avatar was it. In this case, the balance must query the store for more checkout details. And the source of, the, a source of truth is the store database. Let's see what event notification is like in the context of a cafe. So Adam is at the counter and takes an order. And then Adam shouts, large takeaway, to Sarah. Sarah's like, OK, hang on a minute. I've got to ask Adam for more details. I don't have enough information. Hey, Adam, what kind of coffee is it? It's a long black. Great. Still don't have enough information. Is it small or large? It's a large. So Sarah gets a bit frustrated that she has to keep asking Adam for more information. This probably isn't ideal in the context of a cafe, but it's not all bad news. It's actually a totally common and acceptable way of doing an event-driven architecture. With, an event -driven notifi uh, with event notification, when an event is raised, we ask the source of that event for its view of the world. Event notification is nice because the source of the event is always the source of truth. We can always go back there. But the downside here is that additional request for information. If there are many things that are interested in this event, they'll all ask for more information at the same time as soon as that event is produced. So I guess this can be pretty chatty. So what if we added some additional state to the event? This would be what's known as event carried state transfer. And you can see here, this avoids the need for the balance service to query more information from the store, because it's all on the event now. Great. But now as soon as we have this information, it's potentially stale. If we read it again later from our database, if we put it in there, the information we have may not match the source anymore. The database in the store might have new events or new information about this checkout that the balance service has not yet received. And this would be known as eventual consistency. So back to the cafe again. Adam has listened to Sarah's frustrations and he's bought a receipt printer. Good job, Adam. Now, when he takes the orders, he prints out a ticket and he places that ticket on the little thing on the coffee machine where you put the tickets. Sarah can see the order, and it says, long back, large takeaway, two shots. Now she has all the information she needs. And this works out pretty well, almost all of the time, except occasionally a customer comes up and they've uh, missaid something or they've changed their mind. Oh, can you please make that a decaf? Now the information on the ticket is no longer relevant. We should produce a new ticket uh, or an event to say that the order has changed. But Sarah may be partway th already through pulling that shot. That's not a decaf shot when she gets the update. Um, so yeah, it, it doesn't work all of the time. This mostly works better in the context of a cafe, but it still has trade-offs. We're not making all of those extra requests anymore to get extra information. So it's less chatty. But now we have potentially stale events and stale data shared across multiple places. The assumption is that any of these events are essentially out of date immediately. They may not actually be, but we don't know unless we check. 
So I think we know about two different event patterns, but where are all these events actually coming from? Events are produced as a side effect to a change that has occurred in the system. As an example, when we insert a checkout into our database, then a checkout created event is created at the same time. We can send that event to our message broker for other systems to consume. But the database and message broker are two different systems. So what if the message broker is unavailable? This could cause our event to get lost. We don't have the luxury of an atomic transaction here. We need to be able to guarantee that an event gets published when a change occurs in the database. So there are three ways to do that. You've got transaction logs, the transactional outbox pattern, and event sourcing. Transaction logs are a feature offered by most databases. They're created whenever inserts, updates, or deletes occur on the database automatically for you. An event publisher could then poll these logs and translate these changes into events before sending them off to the message broker. The downside here would be that we're using these low-level database logs that sort of give us a coupling to the database technology that we're using uh, instead of something a bit more high-level like business events. So alternatively, we could use the transactional outbox pattern instead of using transaction logs. So we could save the business event into a separate table called the outbox table, and then at the, uh, at the same time as the uh, change occurs. And this can be done in an atomic transaction. Cool, we like atomic transactions. This ensures both the row in the table get updated and the event gets inserted at the same time. After that, a process could do what's called a destructive read for events from our outbox table before being sent to the message broker. And this now avoids using low-level database logs. And then as a third option, instead of saving events as a side effect, what if we just save events and keep that as a single source of truth? So we can do this when the data in our append-only event stream represents a superset of the equivalent data in our mutable table. And this is known as event sourcing. Downstream services can pull from the event store directly without the need for a message broker, although we can have one if we want. And now we can replace those existing tables, our existing mutable tables, with just an append-only event stream. But if we ever want to bring them back, we could do something like a projection or a read model. So now we understand a little bit, hopefully, about event-driven architectures. How can we apply this to our workflows? There are two common event-driven communication patterns. The first one we have is choreography. So choreography, think of a bunch of services as participants, uh, participating in dance routine. Um, all, they, all they have to do is look left for their cues. The other option is orchestration. So orchestration, like an orchestra, there's a conductor. And the conductor doesn't play an instrument, but the orchestra doesn't play without the conductor. So choreography might look a little bit like this in our workflow. The workflow sequence is distributed to each of the participants. The participants communicate with each other through events. The store receives requests to start the checkout from the client. When this happens, it raises an event saying that a checkout created happened. The balance service is waiting for that checkout created event. And when it gets one, the balance is deducted and then a balance deducted event is produced. Inventory is waiting for that balance deducted event. And when it gets one, it can assign that avatar and produce the avatar assigned event. Then we go back to the store. You can see it's waiting for that avatar assigned event. Uh, and then when, when that happens, we can inform the client that the checkout is complete. Choreography might be quite a lot, uh, sorry. Choreography might be quite a lot like how a cafe operates naturally. So Adam takes the order and passes that order to Sarah. Sarah pulls the coffee and passes that coffee to James, and James uh, handles the milk and pours it and calls out the customer's name and the order is complete. One problem with this is what happens when a customer wants to know where their order is? Maybe it's taking too long. Who can answer that question? It depends on where the order is up to in the system. If we ask Adam, all he knows is that he took the, took the customer's money and passed it on to Sarah. If we ask Sarah, she says, I've already pulled the coffee. Uh, I've already passed it on to James. 
So Adam and Sarah both don't know. We look over to James and he has a big queue of coffees that he's got to add milk to. He also looks a little bit flustered, so we should probably just leave him alone. But he probably has our coffee. So with choreography, we may have to ask each of the participants in a workflow to understand where we're up to. Choreography, choreography is elegant in the sense that a dance routine is elegant. Each per person in a dance routine only has to look left for their cues. Each participant in a choreographed event-driven architecture uh, only consumes the events that they care about and produce other events that become cues for the next participant. The downsides might be that it's difficult to observe. If I want to know where this workflow is up to, I may need to talk to each of the participants. There's no central place I can look to here for progress. It's also a pattern that probably works best with sequential workflows. That's where each service does one step and then hands it off to the next participant. It gets tricky to manage when that flow becomes non-sequential. What if cafes, well, most cafes probably don't just make one type of coffee. You've got filter coffee, hot chocolate, decaf. What about when that cafe starts selling food as well? Suddenly there's a lot more variables and moving parts. So before I talk about orchestration, first let's look at the difference between events and commands. You can see here our events are in orange. Services can listen to events produced by each workflow they care about. Uh, and as we can see here, the balance service is listening to events from many different workflows, such as checkout created, game registered, daily reward claimed, achievement completed. For every new workflow, it needs to describe, subscribe to more events. Like a lot of things in software, what if we just flip this around? Would we be able to make that easier? So with commands, which are in blue, the service does not need to know about all of these workflows. Now the balance service just does two things. It handles the add balance and deduct balance commands, and they're highlighted in blue. So let's look at how orchestration uses commands instead of events to coordinate a workflow. Now, there's a lot going on here, but with orchestration, the workflow starts off the same. A checkout created event is created by the store. The event is then received by a new component called the checkout process manager. This now manages the workflow from this point onwards. It begins by sending a deduct balance command to the balance service. The balance deducted event uh, is produced and then triggers the next step of the workflow, which is to send a fund checkout command to the store to notify that the checkout has been funded. The checkout funded event then triggers the next step of the workflow, which is to send the avatar, assign avatar command to the inventory, which is to, uh, which is to tell the store that the, no, I'm lost. <laughs> the avatar assigned event then triggers the next step of the workflow, which is to tell the store that the checkout has been completed. Workflow participants do not need to subscribe to each of these events. They just expose the commands. The balance service exposes the deduct balance command, for example, and the inventory exposes the assign avatar command. Workflow steps are still triggered by events. Uh, for example, the checkout created event triggers the first step of this workflow, and the balance deducted event triggers the next step of the workflow. And we can now also handle unsuccessful workflows due to business constraints. So let's imagine a customer already has an avatar uh, they can't get two of the same avatar. That would probably uh, be a bit meaningless. So if we, send, uh, if we end up in this state, what we need to do is we need to reverse any of the operations that have already happened. This workflow has already deducted the customer's balance. So a reverse operation, an add balance command with the same value, needs to be sent and handled. After the assignment failed, a checkout failed event is raised, and we can consume that. Then at that event then triggers the process manager to send an add balance command to the balance service. Upon success, we can uh, send a request to the store to notify that the checkout has been refunded. Adding the balance back is what's known as a compensating transaction. So the cafe's now growing uh, and they also sell food. So Adam decides it's time to hire a manager to manage the staff and the orders. A customer orders a soy latte and a toasted sandwich. Adam takes the order and takes the payment. Instead of passing the order to Sarah, he passes the order to the new manager. 
The manager then orders Sarah to pull the coffee shot, but at the same time, the manager can order the kitchen staff to start making that toasted sandwich. After Sarah's done pulling the coffee shot, the manager then orders James to handle the milk. And then if a customer needs to know the status of the order at any time, now they can go to the manager. The manager is now responsible for the workflow, although this centralization now means that the manager is a single point of failure. So with orchestration, the workflow logic is centralized. Events are still used to proceed through the workflow, but commands are also used by the orchestrator to communicate with the services. If someone wanted to figure out the current state of the workflow, they can go to the orchestra, uh, orchestrator. This, however, also means that the workflow has a single source of failure. If it ever goes down, the whole workflow stops. In the end, our team decided to implement the orchestration pattern as they found the workflow logic was easier to understand if it was in a single place, and they did want to be able to track the progress of this workflow as it went through. And this is the end of our journey. This journey was about using the architecture for the problem that you were facing at hand. Each of these architectures served a purpose at the time that they were needed. We started by integrating into our existing monolithic architecture that was already working well for a small team. The team got to market quicker and we saw some success early. However, the team outgrew this architecture and decided to later transition to microservices. This architecture allowed multiple teams to build and deploy things independently of each other, but there was more planning and work required in order to build a reliable system. And they had to navigate a few bumps along the way. It was better to make those bumps later in the journey once the team was more established. I think the decisions and the trade-offs that were made at each stage of this journey were appropriate for the problem at hand. The team did not start off with a globally distributed fault-tolerant microservices architecture. And had the team chosen architecture like that, they would have probably run into those availability problems really early on and perhaps never have succeeded, early, uh, have succeeded at all. The key takeaway here is that there's no one-size-fits-all architecture. At each stage of the journey, we required a different architecture and to evolve with the team and the product as we went along. Quick recap. We started with a software development journey. So we went from building an avatar purchase workflow. We went from monolith to microservices. But really what we produced was a distributed monolith with availability coupling. We sought out ways to improve this with an event-driven architecture. So we looked at two types of events, event notification and event carried state transfer, and three ways of producing events, transaction logs, transactional outbox pattern, and event sourcing. Then we dived into communication patterns choreography and orchestration. Both patterns use events to trigger the next workflow steps, but with choreography, we were using events to communicate between services. It's elegant and decentralized, but difficult to observe. With orchestration, we have a centralized workflow. Uh, that centralized workflow uses commands for communication, but it introduces a single origin of failure. Before I wrap up, uh, I think that not enough presentations have code anymore, so I've got some code here. Um, this, is, this is what we would call a checkout aggregate. So we can see here the different functions that an aggregate can accept. I'm only going to go through this uh, really quickly. Um, but you can see here we've got all our, our commands here. This is a pretty simple command handler. So you input a command. This is for creating the initial checkout. This is TypeScript, by the way. Um, some handlers can get a little bit more complex, though like this one. This is the fun handler. Um, don't worry if you, you don't get enough time to read all this code or understand it all. It's a little bit scrappy as well. Um, it contains a projection inside the handler um, to play through the existing events that we've been through. Um, and that allows us to find the cost of the avatar and which customer it's for. And lastly, this is the checkout process manager itself. It's deliberately quite simple in this case. They can obviously be a lot more complex. Um, Sometimes they require their own state management, for example. But this one doesn't. All it does is listen for events and decide to issue commands. Um, and this is real code. Um, I actually built it out. I think my video is not going to work, though. Let's see if I can get a video. How are we going to get it? Try again.
Uh, so we can see here, I'm gonna move in front of this screen. Um, uh, when we click the, the button to claim that avatar for 50 or 50,000 coins, you can observe here the eventual consistency as we have that process manager working through those individual steps. And that's it. Thanks, everyone. Well, thank you very much for that talk. Did anyone have any questions? Because we had a few spare minutes at the end. Any questions? One question. Come on. Um, yeah, I guess, uh, and, and I think um, probably probably a case there for um, uh, that gets harder the more services you have, right? There's more propagation that needs to happen there. Um, so yeah, that, that is a thing that happens. Uh, there are obviously ways to, to share that and make that easier to handle, um, but that is, a, that is something that does happen. Did anyone else have any? There was one up the back I saw. Yep, I'll bring up the mic. Uh, and thank you, and thank you for the talk and a familiar journey to many of us. Um, and given a lot of us have been on journeys like this now, um, would we just start with a state machine all the time and just forget about the journey now on? <laughs> um, that, that's a good point, I guess. Um, I guess uh, early days of a startup, the, uh, a state machine, a state machine to me represents something that's quite a considered design. You might takes quite a bit of time to, to design that. Um, if you're really looking for a quick turnaround, and I'm talking about um, turning around and trying different products within 24 hours, that was sort of our, our in the early days, our sort of time frames, um, where you might have time to jump on a, uh, an idea and see if it works. Uh, you might not have time to do that much upfront design. Um, and that represents, I think, that early stage where we were kind of just building on top of that monolith. There's a few people, there's not a lot of people working on top of each other. I think it's a little bit more receptive to uh, having a little bit less design. Um, but then, of course, as we go, go further, if the team's successful, if it scales, um, doing more upfront design, state machine, good idea. Um, yeah. Thank you. Was there, there was one in the middle somewhere, I think, as well. Oh, one down the front. Down the yep. front there. Oh, we might get the microphone just because there's uh, live streaming. Cheers, thanks. Uh, do you have suggestions for how we could observe a choreography, like how to make that problem easier? Um, I guess you could have, uh, yeah, so it's, it's not immediately observable. We can't go to one, one of these services and go, tell me where we're up to. Um, you could have centralized monitoring, so you could f have all of them feed back to a central service, some sort of uh, status or update as they're going along. Um, uh, but I guess, yeah, just naturally, those services, if they are completely isolated from each other, that you're not going to get that, um, uh, that observability for free. Yep. Yeah, hi. At the end, you said the team chose a choreogra choreography uh, sort of strategy. And I was thinking, as you were talking, there's some uh, law about how uh, organizations tend to structure themselves. Oh, sorry, the software structures itself to fit the organization structure. So I was wondering if the company became more uh, managed, or sort of essentially managed during this time. Could that explain the story? Are you talking about, that's Conway's law, isn't it? Yeah, I think that sounds right. Um, yeah, I, I think so. So, um, and some of those process managers, um, not that one specifically, but some of those process managers replaced a job that an individual was doing, not that you know, the individual got made redundant or something like that, but a, uh, a job that you know, someone was doing manually, we could represent quite easily as a, uh, a process manager with a state machine um, that we could automate. So we would take something that um, someone could maybe do 100 times a day if they were really fast and make that a process that could run millions of times an hour and run through things really, really fast. So I think, I think that's maybe a reflection of modeling or, or Conway's law. Uh, you'd have these processes that we could start taking manual jobs that um, people had roles that were doing and automate them and make them a lot faster and scale the business that way. Uh, 
Um, I was wondering, did you do anything specifically for reporting purposes? Like, did you have a query view? Was the orchestration service responsible for reporting, you know, for sort of statistical analysis or looking back at, you know, reporting purposes for bi the business to be able to report on what's happened in the past? Because that can be a tricky concern in an event-driven architecture. Yeah, I think um, I might need more time to consider that, but I think um, like an event sourcing architecture was another thing that we went with. Um, with an event sourcing architecture, because you've got that entire history of events, you can always go back and quite easily look at, you've got this, um, it's a built-in audit log. You can always go back and you can, you can build reports on that. Is that sort of, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I guess it's just, there's overhead in doing that. And sometimes you, you might choose to push those events into some kind of query database to make it easier to query rather than having to go back and you know, replay all the events. So I guess I was curious as to whether you implemented something specifically like that or you know, was that a concern that you put onto the, the orchestration service, for example, to handle you know, reporting queries since it has you know, some sort of central knowledge of what's occurred in the system? Yeah, um, uh, I think I think yeah. Well, uh, the the business is mostly kind of running off this event sourced architecture now, uh, and we're looking at tools now that we're sort of uh, I guess aligned on that same pattern. Um, we're looking at tools, things like Snowflake allows to do uh, interesting queries, are very very powerful, and get interesting queries over an entire event store um, very very efficiently too. Um, so yeah, that that's an example of one of the ways we do that. Uh, where does a, a publisher subscriber model fit into this? Like, because when we talk about event-driven architectures, that's one of the most common models or the communication models that we use. So. Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, it really you can sort of just append it to um, any of these these models that produce an event. Uh, in, in this case, we have a, a message broker, but if, you, if we wanted to do different ways to, to publish those events out for other things to look at. So message broker in this one, uh, message broker in this one, and then the event sourced architecture, they just read from the store itself, but um, you could of course attach that to uh, some sort of thing that can publish those messages for other things to consume. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question. So, um, microservices and event-driven architecture always looks very satisfying at the beginning when you have two, three, maybe five. But as soon as you step up the game and you have like 50, 100 microservices, starting to understand what's happening when there is an error or we need to track something very specific and get really, really messy and really, really complicated. And that's usually the point where people start thinking maybe microservices was not such a great idea after all. So I was just wondering if you ended up to that level of complexity and what you did about it? Uh, we, we didn't get to that point. I think we made a conscious decision not to have that um, combinatorial explosion of hundreds and thousands of microservices. Um, I'd, I'd point you to a, a talk, maybe uh, we can chat after this, there's a talk by uh, the guy in the first photo, Lee Campbell. Um, he describes, uh, I guess, the different, like he asks the question, what's the size, what size should a service be? Um, you start with uh, a monolith, which might be a bear. Um, you can get a visual representation of a bear. It's quite large. It's very, very hard to uh, uh, go up against a bear. Um, and then you might have ants, which are those tiny microservices. Um, the objective is we're, we're trying to kill the monolith. We're, we're trying to get rid of it. I don't think there are really enough, well, how many ants would you need to kill a bear? probably quite a lot, millions, um, you're not really going to be able to do it very effectively. Um, so he puts, puts together a, um, an idea of something in the middle that's not quite those microservices that are those single function, single responsibility, single thing, um, but hundreds of them that's quite hard to manage. Something it's, that's in the middle that uh, he describes as wolves. Um, you only probably need a couple of wolves to kill a bear, a wolf pack. They work together very effectively. Um, and uh, it paints the idea that you should probably be able to count those services, that, that wolf pack, on, on two hands, no more than that. Um, and you should be able to name them all, give them all a, a meaningful name, so break them up into um, 
something that you, know, you can identify. I've got the something service and this one and this one. If you're trying to identify 100 microservices, you probably get through a few and then just forget and get lost. Um, but yeah, the idea that a wolf pack is probably a very effective uh, a number of ways to, to break up a microservice. A wolf pack is enough to kill a bear. Um, that's, that's uh, I guess, the takeaway there. But watch that talk. It's a, it's a good one. Is there another one over here? Uh, so you said when uh, services fail, the orchestrator starts compensatory actions. Um, what happens when those actions themselves fail? How do you handle that? Uh, I guess you, you might want to be retrying those actions. So those workflows, uh, I'm going to go back again. Um, that workflow failed because of a business rule. So in this case, it's not the same as the, the failing earlier on that you know, this service was down. In, in this case, because we've taken this out of process, we can just keep retrying. That shouldn't be an issue. Um, but in, in, in this case, the, this is failing because of business constraint. So we actually have decided that um, if we get into this state, we can't give someone the same avatar uh, twice. Like You can only do that once. Maybe we've ended up in this state because two requests came in at the same time. Um, so this one here, you, you, can, you can bring that back and you can just retry here. Um, retry uh, the uh, add balance command until it works. What, Does, what if it never works? Is there sort of a manual intervention anywhere? Uh, you, you could do something like a dead letter queue. So if you try a couple of times. I'm not really a believer in dead letter queues because it's the sort of thing, in this case, adding the balance is something you want to do. You don't, you don't want to keep the, this customer's coins and, and keep them indefinitely. It is something that you want to do. I tend to find dead letter queues are just somewhere where these events go to never be looked at again. Um, they, they won't ever trigger any sort of manual action. We should, we should be able to do uh, this reversal, this compensating transaction, um, even if we have to retry a couple of times. Okay, thanks. You guys are, you're all awake still, obviously, you're getting lots of questions. <laughs> Uh, thank you for your talk. That was very interesting. So um, in this model here, you've effectively got a distributed transaction and you've had to do all of that to avoid the, um, the problem of bits of it failing. Did you consider the idea that you could keep the bits that are involved in the distributed transaction together so you get transactional database functionality and use microservices for everything else? Um, yeah, possibly. Um, this, is a, this isn't a real example. It's fairly, fairly contrived, I'd say. So. Um, there are examples where we do have to do quite a lot of things, um, and we did want to split that up into a distributed transaction. Potentially in this one, like I, I really like that atomic, atomic database transaction. Um, I, I kept going on about it. It is just a very, very efficient way to, to, to do things. And I think in this case, because it is quite simple, it's really two things. It's a balance um, change and kind of assigning an avatar to someone. Um, really, I, I kind of like leaning more towards that um, atomic transaction. It's just a very elegant way of handling that. Um, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I guess so, yeah. Uh, it's uh, it's um, taking, taking something that, you know, a, a solution to a problem not going automatically with this monstrously complex thing, because it is, there's a lot going on here. Um, just making that call as to whether something you're looking at is really worth splitting up in this way. Online question. Cool. Online question. Um, is there a place for retry or failure at all? If yes, how deep do we need to go? For example, what happened if the compensating transaction failed? I think I already answered that question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, yeah that, that's that's fair. I think um, retrying. Uh, you, you will do retrying if uh, it failed because the service is down. Something unexpected. Um, I think in this case, uh, this is something we're anticipating. So this is something we are expecting, and it's it's. Handling a business constraint. Um, so, so I think they're talking about like if your balance add one failed, right? Like adding it back in. Yep. Uh, we would just keep retrying that. I, I don't. I don't see. I don't see why that would would fail because we're not doing something like um, deducting a balance uh, and putting it into a negative or something like that. With with adding balance, um, assuming there's no maximum, we're not going to hit any sort of business constraint there. 
Um, obviously, if we, if we do keep retrying it, um, we'd want that to be item potent so that we're not continuously adding the balance and making it go up and up. Um, but yeah, that, that for me, uh, that would be something I would just retry. Did that answer their question? No other follow-up? No? Cool. Um, yeah. Hey, um, two-part question. Firstly, did you have any performance scalability issues with your monolithic solution? And secondly, for uh, say a um, like company that doesn't have the ability or need to grow, would you recommend moving past the monolith? Uh, cool. So part one question was a performance thing. Um, this is again quite a contrived example. It's not. It's not really what happened. But yeah, in our case, we didn't hit that performance limit. Adam. Adam, if you remember, in his cafe, I'm using Adam as the analogy. He was able to handle all the orders. He wasn't actually having problems there. But he was finding that keeping track in his head of all the different things to do was was the hard part. Um, so uh, it was a case of growing the company so that we could effectively manage those things. It wasn't necessarily a performance thing. We do know that uh, in, in this particular case here, we've taken handling most of this checkout out of process. So there's not a performance issue necessarily, but there is that eventual consistency where a process that happens within a single request lifecycle now happens over a couple of seconds. Um, but yeah, that, that we, we weren't hitting any sort of those performance issues. We, we were... Um, uh, mainly, mainly focused on growing the company. We're having more people, having more people working on top of each other. Um, how can we make that more efficient? Remind me again what your second question was. Well, for a company that doesn't have the ability or um, need to grow, would you recommend going beyond the monolith? Uh, no, I don't think so. Like, uh, well, obviously, you you make um, architectural decisions and trade-offs uh, based on the problem you have to solve at hand, but I think it's unlikely or less likely that a small team is gonna have those problems where they're all working on top of each other, um, where, there's, where they can't keep on top of um, boundaries and separations of concerns. It's really a problem that comes when you take your team and you double the size of it or triple the size of it, and there's a lot more of a network effect that happens. Thank you. We've got time for one more. Yeah. So when you take um, something split into components, it's easy to test each individual component. One of the truth realities we found with automated testing is if all you have are tests on those individual components, you cannot prove the system works. You need something that tests the entire system, uh, and we don't like testing in production. What classical integration tests are all based around API testing. How, what kind of strategy do you take for automatically proving and automatically validating something like the Checkout Process Manager? And does it always require recreating the entire system? Or can you, have you found ways to prove it out with just you know, one component in isolation, like the Process Manager itself? Um, I, I tend to find that the, the uh, unfortunately, and this, maybe this isn't, uh, maybe someone's got a better answer to this. I tend to find that the, the way to properly test that is to test fully, including all the integration points. Um, that, that whole system. So it does require building it, building it out, sometimes quite manual. Um, I've got close to it before in the sense that we can create uh, in-memory stores, like the in-memory event store, and, and sort of bring it all up. But it requires, in, in a sort of unit test context, bringing all of this stuff up just so that we can run through one workflow, um, which isn't necessarily ideal. Um, but yeah, I tend to find this is, this is a like I think a pretty well-known thing with um, splitting everything into separate services, it does make it harder to test in that way. I had a quick question before we finish up. What was the name of the game? I'm curious. Uh, well, I mean, so I work with VGW. We, we produce online social games. So um, we have three games, Chumba Casino, Global Poker, and Lucky Land Slots. And we produce slot, slot games and Global Poker and casual games. Um, multiplayer, all that, all that sort of stuff. Um, so this is meant to be, a, again, a contrived example that sort of represents a bit of a mix of all three. Awesome. Well, obviously you piqued a lot of people's interest with the number of questions you had. Um, if everyone could give him a warm up. Thank him for his time today. And I think...